back one more time. All right. So uh, thank you, everyone, for, for, for joining us uh, tonight on a Wednesday night. Uh, tonight we are learning. To Rifal Avram Nisanel Ben Mashaliba, as well as Rafua Shalema to Chaya Zelda Bas Sara Blima and Yaakov, Avram Yaakov Ben uh, Ben Yael, as well as Rafua Shalema to uh, Chava Bas Chaya Esther. We're also learning Leili Nishmas uh, uh, Rabbi Avram Ben Chaim Yehuda and Rabbi Cheskel Ben Rabbi as well as uh, Meryl Bas Usher Lemel. Okay, so tonight as we're getting uh, closer to uh, Rosh Chodesh El, and it is the season to improve ourselves, and this is the season to, uh, you know, uh, become better to, even though really that's always the season, but this is where it's more uh, utilized and it's more focused on. So I want to touch on a... Uh, a, a subject, a topic that's uh, a lot psycho, you know, a lot in psychology, but it's going to d- help us understand who we are uh, and and how. Once you understand who you are, where you come from, it's easier to uh, you know identify where you want to where you want to go, and you can make that path a lot quicker, a lot easier, and a lot clearer. So most people in <clears throat> in life, they kind of stay more or less in the same level. Meaning that if let's say you have a person that has a anger issue. So if they have, you know, again, people work on themselves and they try, but they kind of stay more or less. And when I say most people, I'm not, I'm talking about most people in the world, right? So they kind of stay more or less in that same, in that same sphere, in that same circle of, you know, of where they are. And this is, this tends to be uh, very common in, uh, you know, even unfortunately in the religious circles and the non-religious circles. And let's say somebody does want to improve themselves and they they do want to uh, get themselves uh, uh, closer to God, closer to Akadosh Baruch closer to the Torah. So they they can go through some major changes, but they get to a point where they kind of plateau, meaning that they're at a level and they kind of cruise, uh, you know, through life. And 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 this where most people land that it's kind of uh, in cruise control and more or less, more or less, in this is cruise control through through life. So. Obviously, that's not the purpose that we're here. We're not here to uh, stay in cruise control. We're here to constantly improve, constantly become better, constantly to work on ourselves. And people tend to feel, I can't do it. You know, like I'm kind of stuck where where I am. You know, like have you ever visited, let's say, you know, in Israel, in Masha Arim, there's a, a, you know, like a, 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 this this community of people that live very, or, or in the old city where they, they, they lived like, connected to to like spirituality but they live so simple like everything is completely and you look over there you visit there you're like you know like uh, i can you know i can't relate to that i can never be like that you know like you know like i can never change to be like that you know maybe i could change a little bit but we kind of sell ourselves short that we put ourselves in this little circle and we're like, okay, we're we're maybe on the lower part of the circle, but we get to the bigger part of the circle, but we can't change too much out of it. Like to live a life of, you know, like like they live in Mashar, that I, I won't be able to do that. So we kind of put ourselves in a little bubble and we say we can move around this bubble, but out of that, I can't really uh, uh, move so much. Or, or we could tell ourselves, you know, like, let's say there's a particular mood that we're in and it's not a positive mood. It's not a beneficial mood. And uh, we want to change the mood. We would prefer not to be in that mood. But we say like, OK, we can't, uh, you know, like it is what it is. This is the mood that we are on. And we kind of accept reality in, in, a, in a circumstance where we can do a lot more, but we kind of sell ourselves short and we feel this is weird. This is the bubble. This is the circle. This is the sphere of where I belong. So we create in our mind these certain roadmaps, these certain uh, cognitive biases, if I may, that kind of stick us where we are, and it's hard to go out of it. And, let me, and we're going to go through some examples, and we're going to explain this in, in, uh, in, more, in more depth. So let's say you have somebody who wants to be a doctor really badly. So they really want to be a doctor, and um, they start asking around, is it a good idea that I should become a doctor? Is it a bad idea that I should become a doctor? And they get good reasons to become doctors and they get negative reasons to become doctors. So 
they can get good reasons to become doctors. Uh, like uh, they'll say, okay, you're gonna make good money. Uh, and then they could say, oh, you know what? You're going to be able to help a lot of people. Those are very positive reasons. And then they're gonna get some negative reasons. They're gonna be like, okay, you know, there's very high uh, medical malpractice insurance, uh, you know, or you don't make as much money as they used to from insurance, or you have to work many hours, or there's extensive school schooling. So you'll have pros and you'll have cons to every situation. Now, how are you going to assess that situation? How are you going to go and say, okay, wait a minute, I want to be a doctor and I have the pros and I have the cons. So a lot of it depends on what your motivation, what your devotion, what your, what your bias, if I may, is. If you're very, very motivated to become a doctor, you're not going to listen to the bad pros. You're not going to listen to the negativity. You're just going to focus on the positivity. Like, this is what I want to be. But if let's say you're like, ah, I don't really want to be a doctor. I'm not interested in being in school for the next 613 years, I'd rather do something else. And then, so what you're gonna do is, when you ask around this, you're gonna focus on the negative because it's something, you're already, you have, you're in your mind, you have a decision that you wanna reach. So you're going to travel to that decision and you're going to want to achieve that decision and you're going to, whatever information you gather, you're going to just internalize the ones, the part that you want. So these are these roadmaps in our mind that it's going to that, that we kind of form and that's how we're going to interpret the results so there's two psychological terms that i would like to uh present number one is something called preconceived notions preconceived notions is um it, these are beliefs opinions ideas that you have formed in your mind before having any adequate evidence any adequate experience you already have ideas, stereotypes, assumptions, whatever you already have in your mind. So if the person, going back to the explanation of the doctor, if the person already doesn't want to be a doctor, their pre preconceived notion is they don't want it, right? It's too much, too, whatever it is that the issue is. So any 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 information that's giving on the doctor, be like, no, I, I don't want to because X, Y, and Z. You already have a certain notion that you're going to go. Another example would be, if let's say you believe a certain type of person is always unfriendly, is always very very cheap, is always stingy. You never met the person. You never dealt with the person. But you know this person from this community, from this, uh, you know, town, whatever it is, has a certain, uh, you know, background that presents themselves a certain way that you already know. So you, before meeting these people, before doing proper research on becoming a doctor or not, you already have these preconceived ideas that you already have in your mind. That's Term number one. Term number two is something called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is where you would search for information, but you would interpret that information based of one your of your pre-existing beliefs. Meaning that if let's say somebody is looking at into a particular diet and they really believe in this diet, they believe that this is the diet that, that that's the best. This is the diet that it works. It's best for the health. It's best for losing weight. It's best for everything. So when they're doing research on it, they're only going to pay attention to the articles and the studies that support this belief. They're going to ignore and dismiss any evidence that you know, disputes this belief. So looking back again to the doctor, if a, if a doctor, if, if a, a aspiring doctor really wants to become a doctor and he's going to receive a lot of negative reviews or, or uh, information on becoming a doctor, they're going to dismiss that. They're going to be like, okay, wait a minute. I am not, you know, like, okay, fine. Well, blah, blah, blah. And, they, and they'll focus, they'll double click. They'll focus on the portion of whatever positive it says. So they could read an article of the pros and cons of being a doctor and they'll just focus on the positive. They won't focus on the negative. So there is a aspect of this preconceived uh, notion, these confirmation bias that kind of already set up our understanding of, of, of reality, our understanding of the future, our understanding of certain situations, it's already based off, meaning even in situations that we never even got into, we already have an idea and understanding and how we're going to react and how we're gonna, because we have these ideas already, uh, already inside. <clears throat> I, I would like to explain it. Uh, by the way, this is a very, very common 
uh, um, thought process of, let's say, somebody who is a conspiracy theorist, right? Somebody who is a conspiracy theorist, they will go and they will go from today and from tomorrow and they'll read, oh my gosh, these conspiracy theorists, they have so much time. They're able to do research like scientists and they're able to go through everything and anything that goes on, uh, you know, in whatever the, 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 the conspiracy theory is about. And they will focus only, they're not going to look at the evidence uh, in a truthful manner. They'll look at the evidence of whatever they want to support it. And we do that. It's not only conspiracy theorists. Everybody, every single person does it. You have a certain belief. You have a certain preconceived notion. You have a certain confirmation bias. And you're going to do the research. And you're only going to look at the ideas that you want. Now, the reason why I'm presenting this information, I'm going to give some more examples to make it a little bit clear. The reason why I am presenting this information is that once you know about this information, you have the ability to change a lot easier, a lot quicker, and uh, a lot faster. Like a lot of things in life, it's just once you begin to understand the concept, you can understand the problem, you're already halfway there to the solution. So I would like to go on a, a, you know, a, a little bit of, of what's going on in, the, in, the, in politics, right? So you look at in the American politics, you look at the, it's getting close to the um, presidential elections. And you have the two nominees, the Democratic nominee is Kamala Harris, and you have uh, the Republican nominee as Donald, Donald Trump. Now, <coughs> for everybody who knows to, that's going to vote, knows that the current uh, uh, you know, uh, president is Biden and the current vice president is Kamala Harris, the, the one who is also going for the presidency. So the way that the world is going, that the way that the economy is going, it's not a secret that it's not going the best, let's just say it, right? You know, for many people, it could be going good, Baruch Hashem, I hope it could continue going good. For many people, it's not going as good, it should turn around, it should turn better. But overall, as an economy, when you look at, you know, what's going on in the world, not the best presidential situation that we have going on over here, right? The, the inflation is very high. People cannot afford to live normally. Food prices are, are very high. They jump. Gas prices are jumping. Housing prices are through the roof. <coughs> you have... <coughs> excuse me. The inflation is going up. You have... <coughs> you have all these... You have all these... Uh, um, and again economics, right? Financial things speak a lot to the American people, speak a lot to everybody because that, you know, that's how they live. This is how they survive. This is not going so great under the Biden-Harris, uh, you know, administration. And what's interesting is that a few months ago, the Democratic Party was saying how amazing the economy is. How amazing, right? It's Bidenomics. Yeah, it's so, it's so unbelievable. And all of a sudden, Kamala is now going and, and running for president, and she is promoting that when she gets into office, she is going to fix the economy, which there is something that's off over here. Is the economy good or does it need to be fixing? If it needs to be fixing, you're in the office now. Why don't you fix it? But yet there is this conflicting information going out over there, right? There's, good, uh, there's information that it's, it's good. And then there's information that it's not good. But don't worry, when I get into office, which again, she is now, I am going to fix it. I'm going to present a bunch of conflicting ideas that doesn't make any sense to the majority of people that just look into it. You look into, let's say, for example, uh, uh, the border, right? The, the border is a very hot topic when you're dealing with uh, the, the current politics. So um, the, the, when, when Kamala Harris started off, she was, okay, I'm not going to get into the whole borders or whatnot, but she was involved in the administration. And she was, whether you want to say she was directly in charge of the border or not in charge of the border, is irrelevant for the point of the conversation. But there was an idea of the border wall, right? The border wall originally was a terrible idea for the Democrats, for the Republicans was a very good idea. And now all of a sudden they're switching on it. Now the Democrats saying, oh yeah, it's a good idea. And they're flip-flopping on a lot of these a lot of these policies. Now it makes sense when you try a policy and it doesn't work and you want to recorrect the policy and you want to change it to a different policy. It makes sense. But that's something that you have to explain. And you have to say, listen, we tried this. It didn't work. Now we're going to do better. And now we're going to now when I'm in office, Kamala Harris say it, I'm going to I'm going to achieve X, Y and Z because what we did did not work. Well, 
That's not what's happening. What's happening is what's called gaslighting. What, what's happening is that at one point they say, no, she isn't what, you know, like, let's use example borders are, right? Uh, again, I don't know if anybody's into politics. If you're not into politics, just stick with me because, uh, you know, this, this is just an example. Saying you're not, you're not the border czar. Then you are the border czar. That you're not in charge of the border. You are in charge of the border. The flip flopping is destroying the like, like besides the 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 humiliation that you're giving to the people. Besides the that you know, like it, it's looking down at as if the people don't understand what's going on. If anybody that's been looking in the news and reading on it, this flip flopping policy is not beneficial. And you would think, right, if somebody is. An intelligent person and they're looking and they're reading the, the the news and the American people are involved in the what's going on in the economy and in politics you would think okay wait a minute there's something wrong with this candidate why is it that they're saying something is wrong in one side and something is right in the same side and they're conflicting themselves and they're not conflicting themselves something doesn't match up over here something is something is is very very off over here so this would cause concern for people that want to vote for this side of the party, but yet it doesn't, right? The 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 current statistics show that it's a very it's a very close call between you know Kamala Harris between the Democratic you know party and the Republican party, and you beg to wonder. But, but why is it so close? Like there's no, like people are not happy with, with the way the economy is going. People are not, it's not something that like, okay, it's going good. And you know, like it maybe it could be better. It's not, you, you look at the world, you know, like the way that it's going on in the world, there is a, a big issue in Russia and Ukraine. There is a very big issue in the Middle East. Pe this all started under this administration. And people are, are they know that, but they don't connect the dots, and which is something that was always bothering me until I started delving into it, and until I started realizing like what's going on with the people. Like, why is it that people can go? And and this will bring my point further, and then we'll bring the whole point in a circle. Um, you know, there was a there, not there was there is and there will be a bunch of people that will do that. They do interviews at random pedestrians in the street. Why are you voting for, oh, no, who are you voting for and why, right? So when somebody goes and says, you know, they're voting for uh, the Democratic Party, they'll say, okay, why are you voting for the Democratic Party? But like, what do you mean? Uh, you know, because I believe in the policies. There's not too many policies out yet, but, you know, they, they'll start asking, what are the policies? So you're voting for Kamala Harris. So, so explain to me, what's the reason that you're voting for that person? And whenever they're asked this direct question, they can't answer. Now, they can't answer because there's no information to answer. There's nothing to give really that information. So they bring the most idiotic answers that make absolutely no sense. They give answers, and these are, you, you look at the, the, the Democrats, um, and I'm not here to bash the Democratic Party, I, I'm just here to present the situation as it is. When you look at the people that are voting Democratic, right, the people that are, vote, are gonna vote for Kamala Harris, and they go and they say, why are you voting for Kamala Harris? Their response falls into two basic categories. Number one, because otherwise uh, Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. And they'll say, okay, a threat to democracy. Based off what? I'll be like, oh, based off everything. You know, like, can you give me an example? Just the being of the person of uh, Donald Trump that's based off everything. Like, they can't respond to that. Really, the threat to democracy is more to the Democratic side than to the Republican side. Why? Because the Democratic nominee... Re this Kamala Harris, you replaced President Biden. He was the nominee. There was no voter input. The democratic pro process is that everybody gets to decide together who is going to be the nominee. There was never a decision to make Kamala Harris uh, the, the democratic nominee. She was just placed into it. So if you want to say a threat to democracy, it's the people that you're going to vote for. And then they come up with another situation, another reason why, because she brings joy. And I'm like, I, Rabbi Shalom, can you explain? It's like, what does that even mean? You bring joy, she bring joy? Like, it, it's as if you go and you go to a car dealership and you'd be like, okay, I want to buy this car. 
and be like, okay, fine. Let me say that you, you signed the whole deal. And then as you go out, your friend calls you. So why did you uh, buy this car? <laughs> I want to save the whales in Africa. What? Like, what does one thing have to do with another? What does it have to do with a democratic, you know, like like a, a president having to do? A president's supposed to lead. A surprise, bringing joy. What what is she doing? She's holding hands together, and we're all singing. Like, what is the joy? The, these things make no sense. Now, so the question that I ask myself, and like, okay, I'm like. Everybody can't be that dumb, right? Like everybody, like there's got to be reasons why people are saying this, why people are doing it. Like, and I came to the conclusion, and I may be wrong, but I came to the conclusion, conclusion that people have preconceived notions and confirmation bias. Meaning people have ideas already. Their idea is, is that they need to vote for the Democratic Party. And okay, fine. Granted, whatever it is that you decide. People have confirmation bias. So no matter what you tell them and how idiotic and stupid it sounds and how wrong it really falls into the play, it doesn't matter because I already have my preconceived notions. Like you can ask me questions, but I won't be able to respond because it doesn't matter to me the questions. What matters to me is the end result. I'm already sold for reasons that I don't even know. Really, the reasons are, is it depends on what media you listen to. All right, the media affects us so strongly, we don't even begin to understand the effect of it. You have the same media could tell you something one day, and then it could tell you something contradicting the next day, next day, and you'll never even realize it. You'll never, we're so, so, our, <coughs> our souls are like so sold to this media that many people don't think for themselves. <clears throat> Many people don't think for themselves. They just go based of what they hear and what their friends hear and what's going on in social media and what's going on in this. And they feel, okay, wait a minute. I have to go this path because otherwise I'm going to be weird. I'm going to be an outsider. I'm going to be out. You know, so like people, so many people are falling into like this category without even thinking, without even making. That's the power of marketing. It's amazing and so scary at the same time. That's the, the I, and we look at it in anti-Semitism as well. You look at how do you have people they go and claim there's genocide in Gaza. There's apartheid in Gaza. The, you know, where it can be proven one of 100% certainty that it's all false. But people are falling into it. Why? Because they're biased. They have these preconceived notions. They have these ideas. And they're sold on it. And it's very hard to get... Again, some people are evil. Some people are bad. I'm not... You know, like... But... but there's a majority of people that just this is what the media is kind of selling them and this is the information that they're ingesting and they present this psychological you know like understanding and this is the only way that they see you know there are people that they claim that october 7th never happened they claim that October 7th never happened there is you know these 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 uh, it's it's like holocaust denial in real time now you begin to think like but there's so much evidence. Like there's so much proof of it happening. Like there's so much. Like the terrorists themselves videoed and said that they did it and they'll do it again. Like so, how could there be this denial? And how could there be people that believe that denial? Because the answer is they have this confirmation bias. It's they have this this idea, and they're they no matter whatever else comes out, they're stuck to it. They're stubborn to it. Now. These people, it's very hard to change. They don't see what's so very clear. And they, they, they don't even see the problem. So you can't even present to them the solution because there isn't an issue. And this, you know, like the, the bottom line, when you look at these, you know, uh, these, these crazy ideas, these crazy, like, like wild thoughts, if somebody has a preconceived notion, if somebody has something that they already, you know, like have in their mindset before they even hear about the story, they have this confirmation bias, it's, it brings a person almost to not caring to look for the truth. And we see this, and, and soon this is going to all make a lot of sense. We see this in a, in, in kind of a spiritual sense. Have you ever wondered how you have, um, you know, Christians that they read the Torah, Right, so they read the, the the first testament, but they don't listen to it. Well, they listen to it partially, but mostly not, and they focus on the secondary one, like the thing. Even though it says in the first one there will never be a second one, like even though the first one contradicts the second one, 
in like so many places. And you wonder, like, wait a minute, if you're a true scholar, if you're really looking in for the truth, how do you not see it? And the answer is, is because people have this preconceived notion. They have this preconceived thing that this is what they want to see. So they're only going to see what their eyes want to see. That's like a, cra- that, that's a crazy thought process. And it's easy to say, okay, yeah, I see that. They're crazy. That doesn't make any sense. I see that in the, in the, in the you know, in the, in the, let's call it the voter party. I see it in the, you know, in the spiritual party and it's easy to see it outside it's easy to see it on the outside it makes no sense and be like i don't understand like the facts are so out there they're so straight they're so simple you don't have to be so smart you just have to like read a little bit and you can make conclusions on yourself like how do you come to such false conclusions how do you come to some sort of conclusion that this is the right path for the future when you know that it's not working right now and the answer is because you have this preconceived notion they have this preconceived notion and they can't be begin to understand or comprehend anything else because they're already sold, they're biased, they're sold on something else on it. Their psychological thought process, their their psychology, their intellectual process is sold and it's kind of like the horse with those blinders. That's all that they see. Now, it's easy to say, oh yeah, they're wrong and they're wrong and they don't see it, but we don't realize we do it to our own day-to-day lives. And I want to present this information we're going to go a little bit on a journey on this uh, to try to explain it. And then we're going to hopefully try to explain how we get out of it and how we go and, and grow from it. So I would like to use uh, an explanation on uh, like marriages or spouses or relationships. So <clears throat> we create a roadmap the way that we see our spouses, right? So it's based off a few factors. It's actually based off a lot more factors that I'm going to explain, but these are the factors that I want to, to you know, to touch upon. And these I feel is one of the most uh, main factors. Again, you may agree with me, you may not agree with me. This is a psychological, you know, analysis. So, uh, you know, take it as you may. So the way that we see our spouse is based off a few things. I will go through four things. Number one, our personality. And we'll give examples and we'll explain it. Number two, our spouse's personality. Number three is our background. Number four, our experience with our spouse. So let's, before we explain that, let's just take a little bit of a detour and just to explain how this can, how let's say, for example, a background can affect us. So let's say you have a woman who, uh, scenario, let's use two scenarios, right? Scenario number one, a woman, uh, this, uh, it's a divorced woman. In scenario number one, <clears throat> the previous marriage of this woman was married to someone who had financial difficulties, meaning that it caused a lot of strain in that in, in the home. Financial difficulties caused a lot of strain in the home, and uh, one thing led to another, it didn't work out, and uh, uh, they weren't able to pay the bills, and led to fighting, and you know, so on and so forth, and they ended up parting ways, ended up getting divorced. When she's going to be dating for the second, her second husband, what is going to be very, very up on that list? And that is going to be Someone who has financial, you know, stability, has some sort of, uh, you know, money coming in because she has lived through what financial difficulties are. So now she's going to be looking what she thinks is going to be a successful marriage. And that's the opposite of that. So she's going to look for someone who has some sort of financial stability, have some sort of, uh, you know, financial backing. Scenario number two, you have a woman who was married, uh, was also divorced, but in her first marriage, she was married to a very successful workaholic. Uh, Let's you know, make it a lawyer, a very successful workaholic lawyer. This person was never home. He never saw the kids. He never saw her. He never took her out. He never had any relationship with her. And while she didn't need to work, she had maids. She had everything that was going on. She never felt she had a relationship with her husband. So what type of person is she going to look for in the second marriage? She's not going to care about money. She's not, that's not going to be on the top of her list. What well, the top of her list is, is, is going to be someone that's going to be able to spend time with her. Somebody that's going to be able to build a relationship with her. Somebody that's going to be able to connect with her and spend time with the kids. That's who she's going to look for. So we have over here two women that were in a divorce and two things are completely, you know, they, they decide what priorities are completely different. Meaning that based off their background, they define what's going to be their priority and what's going to be important to them because it's all based off the background. You go to woman number one, you could say, okay, listen, your, your husband's going to make a lot of money, but he's not going to be home so much and be like, okay, but at least we'll be able to pay the bills. Like she's not going to be thinking about what the other woman is thinking about and vice versa. 
So let's go based off these four things and let's build a little bit of a scenario so we can understand it and how this background, our psychology, will build our uh, personality. So let's say you have a, a woman. A woman's personality, we'll go to the woman's personality, the man's personality, the background, we'll throw in a situation, we'll see how the results uh, come out. So you have a woman and this woman's personality will be a little bit anxious and a little bit ambitious. That's her personality. Of course, she has a lot more to, the, to her than that personality, but these are the things that we're going to focus on just for this, uh, uh, this scenario. Now you look at the husband. The husband is not as ambitious and he can accept criticism. That's his personality. Now let's give a background. So the background is, is that this woman grew up with financial difficulties in her growing up with her parents and her parents worked very, very hard and long hours to be able to support the family. Now, the husband's experience, it doesn't matter, the background doesn't matter. Now let's, they're, they're married, now the situation. The situation is, is that the husband works at a job that pays okay, covers the bills, but just, meaning that they're going month to month. The husband is okay with that, based off his background, not a big issue for him, you know, he's okay, he's getting by, whatever, you know, like, okay, so he can't you know, afford luxuries. But the woman, she has a little bit of anxiety, she's more ambitious than him, she gets anxious, so she comes to a conclusion, she says, wait a minute, my husband, he isn't ambitious, must be that he's lazy, so she says something to him, but the husband can't accept criticism based off his background, because let's say his background, like, you know, like the, the, you know, the parents were always bickering, criticizing one another, so his background, he can't accept criticism, her background, she needs to be more, you know, more ambitious, and, you know, the situation now results itself in a shalom bias, you know, major, major issue that, you know, that comes on. Now, if these two spouses had different backgrounds, the situation, the shalom bias would possibly not have occurred or it could have occurred worse. It all depends on a lot of what was happening in the background, meaning that our situation, our personality, how we see certain things is based off our backgrounds, based off our interactions, based off our current situation, meaning that when we look at something, and we get upset about something, we think we're right to be upset about that something. But we don't realize the reason that we're upset about that something is because of all the baggage that we just brought along to that something. How we grew up, how our relationship with that person, how the situation is with that person. We're bringing all that baggage in and now we're assessing the situation. Meaning that we're coming to the situation with this, you know, uh, with with these, these um, preconceived notions and with these confirmation bias. These are how we're coming to this situation and we don't even begin to realize it. We don't even begin to understand it. The question is, and I hope you guys are still with me, the question is, how can we change that, right? So we, we, we've come to a conclusion that we, every situation that we present ourselves and we think we may be right or may be wrong, the reason why we're feeling a certain way is not based off actual facts usually, it's based off how we feel and the baggage that we're bringing along with us to the situation. Here is how I was brought up. Here is how was my interaction with you. Here is how I was in my years in yeshiva. And here is how I was my years in college. You, you bring all this in and that's how you respond to a certain situation. So we come to a situation and we only see the blind we don't see anything else because this is how we're wired to to believe this is how, this is the roadmap that we build ourselves so the question that we have to ask is, can we change that roadmap? Because many times that roadmap is not correct. That roadmap is not accurate. You have, you know, you have a mother and is, is very stressed out, is doing so much, and the, and, and the roadmap that she has is up to here. And if she would just change the roadmap, it would lower the bar so much and they'll be able to see things in different, in different, uh, uh, in different viewpoints, in different ways, and all of a sudden your, your mind works very differently. Once we realize that we have the blinders on and we have the ability to like, even if we don't take them off, but we know that we could turn our head and look around, that's already a huge, huge bonus. So these roadmaps, these biases that we have, this is based off our relationship, this, these bias are 
on our spouses, on our kids, on our outlook, and most importantly, on ourselves. Like people claim they can't do something. We can't learn. We can't keep Shabbos. We can't grow because this is me. I have my blinders on. I have this preconceived bias. I have these, I have these preconceived notions. I have these things. I, I, I can't. It's not me. This is me where I am right now. So what we're doing is, is we're like those people that have those blinders on and we can't see anything else because we're not looking around because we have this baggage that we came and this is the way that we could we could understand reality and it's all based on our psychology and our personality of our upbringing and of, of everything else that came into into play and the reason why this is so important is that we're coming to Elul and people want to change and people want to get better and people kind of put themselves in this little box and this is like, this is where really I could change. But you don't realize if you just take off those blinders, there's a whole world that you can change. There is so much that you can grow. You could become a completely different person for the benefit, hopefully, right? But you have to realize that you have to take off those blinders. You have to take off those bias that you have built, those roadmaps that you have built that you don't even see the other options, the other opportunities. So let's try to explain why and how uh, to go about uh, this. So there is um, something called Chachma Bina and Das, right? So Chabad is based off Chachma Bina and Das. In fact, Chabad, the acronym for Chabad is Chachma Bina and Das, right? Chesbez uh, and Atav. Chachma Bina and, uh, I'm sorry, and, uh, um, uh, and Dala, Das. So this is what Chabad, uh, you know, represents. But but again, the the Chabad aspects, meaning not the Chabad Chasidus, the Chabad aspect is very important. What is the difference between Chachma, Bina, and Das? So Chachma is wisdom. But what is wisdom? And in, in, in this reference, I'm gonna what I'm going to do is I'm gonna give you an explanation of what it actually means, and then we're gonna use this idea and we're gonna transfer it into a different concept, not what it's referred to, but in a different concept. So and you'll soon see what I mean. So. What is Chachma Bina Das? Let's just try to explain the basics, uh, the, you know, basic understanding of it. So Chachma is where you have practical knowledge or insights, meaning that the, uh, the, the understanding of Chachma, Pi Kabbalah, Pi Hasidus, is that there is a sudden flash of an understanding, a, like a momentary, like, aha moment, right? Like, let's say someone's learning Torah, and they're trying to understand something, and all of a sudden, they have, like, a flash of a moment, and they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then they're, like, trying to grab it, and sometimes they're able to grab it, sometimes they're, like, you know, whiskers away. Uh, but the, this, like, flash of understanding, that's chakma. This, like, you know, initial understanding. Then there's something called Bina. Bina involves analyzing and understanding the implications of Chachma, meaning it's it's the process of examining the information. So you have a Chachma, and we'll give examples and you'll be able to understand this very clearly, so just bear with me. So you have a Chachma, a flash of understanding. Bina is taking that flash of understanding and analyzing it and really understanding it. <coughs> And then you have Das. Das is taking that Chachma, turning it into Bina, really understanding it, analyzing it, and then internalizing it, right? Taking that and making it into some sort of permanent change in your in your life. Now, I'll give you two examples. One is from Rabbi Noah Cholowerk, and one is going to be a Chabad example. So Rabbi Noah Cholowerk, was my Meshkiach when I was in Yeshiva in, in Tarar, um, would uh, give an example. The example is, let's say you have a child, and a child is told, don't touch the stove. Because the stove is hot. This is Chachma. It's a bit of information, right? Like a, a piece of a nugget of knowledge. And this is what the child has. Now the child goes, sees the stove, but he sees a spot on the stove. And now he thinks, I probably shouldn't touch the pot because if the stove is hot, the pot is probably hot. So he just used Bina. He took that knowledge and he analyzed it and he grew upon it. And that's where he came up that the pot is probably hot if it's on the stove. Then the child goes and touches the stove, and he goes, ouch, and he puts his finger in his mouth, and he burned himself. Now the child has das. Now it's internalized into that. Now let, let me give you another example, and now you'll be able to, you'll, you'll be able to understand it very clearly. The, imagine you have a doctor. Doctor lived in the 60s where everybody was smoking. And this doctor smoked a couple of packs of cigarettes a day, was a big smoker, sold cigarettes, let's say, in his lobby, who knows, whatever. And uh, he sees one patient and he notices that the patient has a some sort of chronic cough and, uh, you know, prescribes him something. And then this keeps on happening. He keeps on seeking, seeing patients that have this cough. And he correlates it, he connects to it that, you know, all these patients that have this cough, they also smoke. So he has this like flash of an understanding that smoking and coughing are somewhat related over here. 
So he has this like flash of information. That's Chachma. Now he begins to do some investigating. He begins studying cases. He begins looking at some sort of disorders that are related to the lungs and are related to smoking. He starts looking at statistics. So now what he's gathering is Bina. He's taking that initial understanding and he's gathering this information, this, uh, you know, and, and he's bringing it to that, and that's the Bina. <clears throat> the conclusion that he can come to would be that you know smoking is bad for you right so he used his chachma to come up with understanding that smoking is bad and that's what he put his information that smoking is bad and that's the level of bina now the question is does he stop smoking because he also smokes so if he doesn't stop smoking that means that this knowledge was at the level of chachma and bina but it didn't get into das he didn't internalize this information if he stops smoking because of this information, so he took the Chachma, he took the Bina, and he internalized it into the Das, he internalized, internalized that, you know, that, that information. So let's take that concept, right? So the concept is that there is a fleeting thought, uh, an idea. There's gathering information on the idea, and then there's implementing that idea. So let's look at that and how we improve ourselves. In our and I'm going to use these terminologies, Chachma Bina Vadas, regarding improving ourselves on Midos. This is not what it's in reference to, but this is the way that I'm going to explain it based off that. Uh, meaning that this is not the way the Hasidut explains per se the Chachma Bina Vadas, but I want to utilize this understanding to how we change ourselves with this terminology. So I hope that's that you know that's clear. Uh, um, uh, but but in, in any case, whether you gather it, <laughs> gather it or not, it's fine. So let's say. A majority of us have this flash of things that we want to be better, right? So we have this chachma. Like, yeah, I want to improve myself. I, I want to work on myself. I, I want to be better. So, but it's a flash. It's like, a, this is like initial inspiration, right? You're sitting in a class. You're hearing, uh, you know, the rabbi speak or the speaker speak. And you're like, yeah, you know what? I, I want to be better. And you have this initial flash of inspiration. So for many people, that's how it stays. It stays as a initial flash. Some people take that flash and be like, you know what? This uh, rabbi spoke about that it's important to learn a lot of Torah, right? So maybe I want to, uh, you know, learn a lot of Torah. I want, I want, I want to work on this. So they take that flash and they start delving into it. How am I going to learn into it? When am I going to learn? What am I going to learn? Right? They're they're looking into it. They're taking that chachma. They're taking that flash and they're bringing it into bina. Now, few people go to the level that they actually internalize it. So they have the flash of like inspiration. They have the flash of chachma, the understanding. They take the bina, they learn about it, and then they internalize it, right? You have a few people, let's say they listen to class about anger. They're like, you know what? I need to work about this. So they have the flash, then they work on the bina. They start gathering information. What do I need to work on? What do I need to improve? How do I need to improve it? What am I supposed to do? And then they do das. They implement it into their day to day, uh, the day to day life, where it becomes where it becomes part of them. And this really, by the way, is the essence of what you're supposed to be doing when you're learning Torah. The uh, the uh, the pasuk in Devarim, chapter six, verse six, tells us, "Vahayodvarim The Torah tells us that it should be on your heart, meaning that it should be implemented inside of you. It should become part of you. When you're learning, it's not just that you're listening to concepts, right? You're coming to a Torah class. You're listening to a class on TorahAnytime.com. You're listening. You're learning. It's not enough that you're hearing this information. You got to implement it into your. You have to turn it into das. You have to implement it and turn it into your own day to day life. <clears throat> We see this also in Perkei Avos, in the fourth uh, chapter, the fifth Mishnah. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Yaisi Aimer, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Yaisi says that Halaymi Torah al Manas If somebody learns Torah on the condition to teach, so my speaking be yad little model lamid, they <coughs> will allow this person to teach, to learn, and to teach. But the Halaymi al Manas Lasit, if someone learns on the condition to do, they want to take that information, they want to learn the Chachma, they want to take it into the Bina, and they want to bring it into the Das, they want to implement it into their own mind, they want to actually do it, right? You learn something, you want to do it, you want to work on yourself. So the, the Mishnah says, I'm speaking, a little more to Lamid Lishmar Velasais. The whole slew of lists, you're going to learn, if, you, if the purpose of you learning is that you should be able to do, you're going to be able to learn, you're going to be able to teach, you're going to be able to 
garden, you're going to be able to do. You're going to be able to do everything on it. Because that's the purpose. The purpose is you're supposed to internalize it. The problem is that most of us, what we do is we hear a class, yeah, it's up there, you know, like, okay, we inspire maybe, but it's kind of stays in the level of Chachma. It never goes into the level of Bina or Das. And that's a lacking aspect. So we have this Chachma, we have this Bina, we have this Das, we have, but it kind of stops, it kind of stops, and many times it's because of our, maybe it could be our personality, we're like, well, that's nice in the Chachma realm, but like I can't, I've never implemented in my own day-to-day life. So we, the, our improvement kind of, kind of stops at a certain, at a certain point. Now, this can also be like, the reason why we're missing a lot of this, and I want to throw a little bit of a caveat in, in you know, in here, is uh, there's a pasuk in um, in in, in Parshas Ekev, in Devarim chapter seven verse twelve, right? Bahaya Ekev Tishmun Es Hamishpat The 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 terminology that the Torah uses is Bahaya Ekev, and it will be because you will listen to these, uh, you know, to these mishpatim, to these ordinances. But the 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 word Ekev, Rashi. You know, it explains that it's the the it's 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 a mit, the mitzvah hakalis. It's the light mitzvahs that people tran, trample on them with their akev. Akev in Hebrew also means a heel. There are some things that people just like you know mitzvahs that they kind of like you know like walk on with their with their heel. They don't they don't actually you know. Uh, um, you know, do it. They kind of like trample it. It's something that they miss with their, you know, with their heel. And this is something that we need to focus on, on the things that get trampled easier. But I want to give a different, you know, explanation. That, that, that's the explanation of Rashi. For the the Pituchei Chotam, which is Rabbi Yaakov Abu Chatzera, <coughs> brings down the Arizal. That the Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, uh, you know, this, this statue, which, re, you know, which represented the four exiles. We're not going to get into all, it's all in, in Daniel. We're not going to get into all the details of it. But Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. Um, and the legs, the legs refer to the last two exiles, right? There's four exiles. The, the legs are the last two exiles. Well, the, it's really the exile of Edom, but it's really broken down to Edom and Yishmal. And that's the two legs, which is Edom and Yishmal. Rome and, uh, meaning the Christianity and Islam, if you may. Now we know that what is on the bottom of the legs, that is the heel. And the, what, what our sages have been telling us, and that our and our rabbis have been telling us, that in our day and age, we are on what is called the Ikfasad de Mashiach. Ikfasad de Mashiach means the heels of Mashiach, right? So if you see the statue and you know that the bottom two is the last two exiles, we are at the heels of those exiles. We're at the bottom, the very bottom of those of the of the exile, and that is the um, the point of where we are right now. Now, what is at the heel? Besides, the heel is something that can trample on with the way the Rashi explained it. But what's also with the heel? The heel is something that doesn't have a lot of nerves. It doesn't have a lot of nerve endings, and the heel is something that's very numb. Now, at the end of days, this is what's going to happen. At the end of days, before Mashiach comes, which is in our day and age, we're going to get numb. We're going to get numb. We're not going to see certain things. We kind of get numb when we understand that we're already numb to so many things. Uh, but but we get numb to so many aspects of growth, so many aspects of things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends us because of our numbness. HaKadosh Baruch Hu constantly sends up these signs to help guide us and support us and, and bring us to a certain way. Now, there was uh, I want to share with you a story from Rabbi Duvi Ben Shushan. Who brings down the story that there was a um, Rosh Kolal in uh, Bnei Brak that went over to the Chazan Ish, right? The, the, he goes over to the Chazan Ish, the God of at that time, and he says, Rabbi, I, I don't have any money for payroll, right? I have these people learning in my call, I need to pay them, I don't have any money, I need to go to America to raise, uh, to raise funds. And he came in, he says, Could I have a blessing that I should be successful? So the Chazanish responds, when the time comes, you'll have the money. So the rabbi, the Rosh Kola, says to the Chazanish, says, well, I'm going to America. Can I have a blessing that I'll be successful? And the Chazanish again responded, when the time comes, you'll have money. And the rabbi was not getting the blessing that he wanted, right? The blessing that he wanted is that you're going to go to America, you'll be very successful, you have the money, and you'll go, you know, go back. You know, you'll, you'll be able to, to pay off all the, all the people that, you, you know, that, that, that need to get the money. But he wasn't saying that. He said that the end, when you need the money, you'll get it. And he kept on asking, and the Chazanish kept on responding. And so he said, okay, well, you know, what am I going to do? 
he takes a plane, he flies into America, he does all his rounds, he goes to all the shuls, he goes to the Landau's, he goes to, you know, when he lands in New York, he goes to Landau, he goes to Shemar Shabbos, he goes to uh, the, the Situ, he goes to everywhere that he needs to go, he's collecting, he's visiting the businesses, he's visiting the people's houses, but it wasn't successful. It was just not, for reasons, it just was not working out. Like he barely, after two weeks, he barely made enough money to cover his ticket. Said he had to go back. It wasn't being successful, so he books a flight back. He books a flight back. He lands in Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. He gets onto the tarmac and he sees over there one of his students is waving at him frantically. Come, come, come! He's like, I, you know, I just landed. And he starts. He runs with his little suitcase. He starts running. There's what's what's going on? He said, you know, yeah, we have to hurry up. We have to go back to the yeshiva. So there's a guy there from from uh, South America. Looks like he has, you know, a very successful guy. He's waiting to speak to you. I told him I'm going to pick you up from the airport. Maybe he wants to give the, the yeshiva some money. I, you know, I, I know something's going on. We have to rush back because I told him that you're going to be right there so they jump into the car and they rush back to the yeshiva they get back to the yeshiva and the yeshiva gets out of the car and he sees this guy standing in Bnei Brak with like a beige suit blue shirt very not the Bnei Brak vibe right and he goes over to him he says Shalom Aleichem how can I help you and the South American uh, man starts telling him, he says, you know, uh, my father used to live on the block of the yeshiva. And he used to always watch people walk in and out of this yeshiva. And it always, you know, resonated with him. And it always, you know, made him feel, you know, very good. And he always, and recently he just passed away. And I wanted to do something in his memory for his, uh, for his neshama. And I remembered about this yeshiva that he always used to speak about. So... I came to this place and I see over here you don't have a name on the on the thing. He says maybe I could donate the name of the building, maybe you know, like for my on the, in the memory of my father. He says is the name for sale. Now this rabbi was just on a fundraising trip, didn't make any money. He was on a flight, he barely slept. He's going over there, he's like, uh, how, you know, like is the name for sale? Yeah, I guess it is for yeah. He's like, I guess it, yeah, I, I guess it's for sale. I don't have a, you know, the name on the building. So he said, okay, so how, how much, how much for the for the name on the building? And now he's starting to think, is a name? How am I going to start giving out a number? Like, he can't even think straight like a number. He's starting to contemplate what's the right number to ask. Do I ask for $100,000? Do I ask for $200,000? You know, like, and uh, this, he's, meanwhile, he's contemplating this in his mind. And this, uh, you know, South American, you know, Jew goes over to him and he says, would, and, and, and I'm using for inflation, it says, would around uh, $12 million, would that uh, cover the, the name for the building? And the rabbi is thinking 12, mil, 12 million. Yeah, yeah, you know, in his mind, he's like jumping. He's like, "Are you kidding me? Twelve million? He says, "I was going to ask one hundred twenty thousand. He's like, "Twelve million? He says, "Yeah, that you know, that could work." You know, like that, 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 that's, that, that sounds fair. And the, the guy goes and he writes a check. He finally wire, he wires the money, and they make this whole big, huge, you know, event. And they, you know, they make a, they, a big meal and they make this big ceremony. You know, while the, the, the plans are in action, this Rav goes back to the Chazanish. And he goes to the Chazanish. And the Chazanish sees him. He says, no, how is America? Were you successful? And the Rav goes to the Chazanish. He says, says Rebbe, you know how America was. It was a disaster. I didn't make, I barely made for my, you know, money for my flight. But the Chazanish responded, but do you, do you have money for your, for your, for, for your Avrechem? Do you have money that you're able to pay, you know, to pay the bills? And the Rav answered, he says, I have money for this month, I have money for next month, I have money for this year, I have money for next year, I have money for the next, next uh, you know, couple of years. So the Chazanish says, see, hey, Baruch Hashem, it worked out. But then the Rav says, but Rebbe, you got to help me out over here. He says, if you knew this, why did you tell me to go to America? Why did you tell me then the month that I have money? He says, why did I have to fly out there? I could have stayed over here. I could have learned. Why do I need to go and break my back for two months, two weeks and go around over here? If the money was supposed to come anyways, why did I have to go and travel? So the Chazan is responded and he said, you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu works in a way that you have to do your shtadlis. The way that the money is going to come is very likely not going to be through your ishtadlis. But you have to do a certain, a certain ishtadlis. And in life, we do a certain ishtadlis. We go a certain path. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends the money in a different way mostly. Most of the very successful people, the multi-billionaires of the world, they made their money not from something that they were planning on doing, but something that just happened to happen. 
Now, why? Why does Hashem do it that way? And Hashem does it to us in our day-to-day -day life. And the reason is, is because Hashem is sending us signs. Hey, by the way, I am here. It doesn't matter what you do. I am showing you that I am here. We're numb to reality. We don't see the reality. We don't see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is there. So that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to constantly send us signs every so often. Hey, I am here. And it might not be in a $12 million check, but it's going to be in a ways that we, you know, see a parking spot or look at the, I don't know, I got a thousand billion different ways that you could say, oh, this is Hashem saying hi to you and showing you that he is here around and he is existing. And the reason why it has to happen all so often, it happens very often, we're just a little bit blind to it because we have our blinders there so we don't look around, but if we take off our blinders, we'll be able to see Hashem everywhere. And Hashem is doing that because we're in a generation that is numb. And Hashem is sending us signs, signs, signs. Hey, by the way, I know you're numb, but look, I'm here. Look, look at me, I'm right over here. <clears throat> there, was a, um, there was a man who grew up in Herzliya. And uh, a very, very wealthy area of Herzliya. Very grew up very wealthy, very spoiled from since he was little. Yeah, the parents gave him everything. By the time when he turned eighteen, he got a car. You know, like like everything that he wanted. And this type of kid, he was very. He had a lot of questions, so he always was asking questions. He asked questions to his parents, and his parents, you know, if they didn't like the question, if it was too like religious, his parents were very secular. If it was too religious, they were like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Eventually, you'll. Uh, <coughs> You'll, you know, you'll get to it. It's not important right now. So he used to ask a lot of questions. Then he got into high school and then he got, you know, like with exams. So he thought he didn't think about it. And then eventually after high school, he went to the army. He couldn't really think too much about it. After the army, all these questions came back. You know, he's like a guy who looked into life and wanted to understand the deeper meaning of life. And he couldn't come to, to conclusions. He, could, he was missing some answers. So he decided that he's going to take a trip, a trip that unfortunately many Israelis take, and he's going to take it to the Far East, but it's not going to be for a, he wasn't interested in having fun. His goal was more a spiritual one. So he goes and he tries to figure out his answers to his life questions that he has. So he travels from monastery to monastery, from temple to temple, seeking answers. And he met some people, gave him an answer here, gave him an answer there, but he's asking a lot of questions. And eventually one guy told him, he says, you want answers? He says, you got to go to this remote village in the Himalayas. And it's, this village is called the Roof of the World because it's on a crazy, crazy high, uh, uh, you know, area. And, you know, it's very interesting, in the Himalayas, airplanes don't go around that area because it's it has a lot of mountains there and they can't in certain turbulence they have to go certain low so airplanes always avoid that that entire area so it's a very quiet area and it's in the mountains and you don't hear no like like it's a place where people contemplate you know reality usually coming into wrong conclusions but the contemplation nonetheless is happening over there so he goes and he visits a certain temple and he meets this uh, this guru uh, this guru, you know, was known to answer all life's questions. So he goes and he starts inquiring about it. And he says, you know, the guru is about to start this three-week course and will answer all your questions. Sign up for the course. So this Israeli boy says, fine. Well, signs up for the course. And he starts joining this uh, these classes that this guru is giving. And this guru is explaining the purpose of the world and going through all these, uh, you know, these details on, on life and the purpose and the meaning. And, and, and the guy, the Israeli guy gets... You know, quite a few questions answered. And every time he asks the guru other questions, you know, like some of them he got answered and some of them he sees the guru is like, you know, dancing around it. So after three weeks go by, he feels like, you know, gained a lot. He got a lot of answers. And uh, the last uh, uh, the last day, the, the guru, the, after the last final lecture, the guru gives a private audience with each audience member that could ask him anything that they wanted. So the um you know he was waiting in line over there and he gets to the guru and he has his private uh, audience with the guru and he sits with the guru and he says you know i have a lot of questions some of them you answered some of them you danced around he says but one of them is keeping me up at night and i can't i, I need an answer to it he says this is m more so than all the other questions so the guru says ask my child what's your question so he says you know we're right now in this course there's 14 people Right, there's a few people from Australia, there's a few people from New Zealand, there's a few people from different parts of Europe, there's a few people from America. And the guru's like, yeah, so we have people from around the world. He says, yeah, but one thing I don't understand is 12 out of the 14 people are Jewish. 
He says, what's up with that? Why are there so many Jews in your course? And the guru says, he says, you know, my dear disciple, I, I thought you were smarter than this. He says, don't you know that 80% of the world's population are Jews? And he says, that's why we have, you know, Jews here. And this Israeli guy says, what are you talking about 80%? The Jewish population doesn't even make a percent. It's not even a half a percent of the world population. There's a small, minuscule amount of Jews. And the guru is like, I don't understand how, like, like, where are you coming with this information? He says, you know that I am 86 years old. He says, I've been doing this since, he says, my father started this religion. My father started this, all this, the, you know, like, and I've sat with him since I was six years old. He says, you know, for the past 80 years, he says, 80% of the people that came visit here are all Jews. Of course, 80% of the world is Jewish. There's no question about it. He says, I can't believe that I was teaching you the song. And, and you're, you're uh, you know, it really bo it bothered the guru a lot. And the guy was like, the guru was like way off, like the statistics are off. And it really bothered him, but he left. He got, you know, like whatever, he wasn't getting his answer. He flies back to Israel. He goes back to Israel and he's on a bus in Yerushalayim. And, you know, this question also always still bothered him. And then, you know, he sees not too far from him is sitting a guy that looks like a distinguished rabbi. You know, whatever. The rabbi, I mean, again, you're in Yerushalayim, but Abraham, yeah, I, pretty much everybody looks like that. But. He said something stuck out about this, and this guy looked like a hush of a rabbi. So he goes, sits down next to this rabbi, and he says, Rabbi, I have a question for you. And he says, he gives him his whole background. He says, you know, I grew up secular, I had a lot of questions, I went to Tibet, I went to the Himalayas, I went to the Guru, and I asked this. And he said, uh, you know, something that bothers me, he says, why is there that 14, that 12 out of the 14 people over there are Jews? He says, we're such a small percentage. And he says, and, and the guru was like, yeah, the majority of the world is, is Jewish. It's like he's so far off from wrong, but I can't begin to understand. I can't begin to comprehend it. So this rabbi smiled at him and he says, you know, the guru only knew, he's cut off from the world. He only knows what he sees. He saw really 80% of Jews coming in every single time. So in his mind, he came to the conclusion that 80% of the world is Jewish. He says, but let me ask you, he says, why, the rabbi goes over to this Israeli man. He says, why is it that 80% of Jews are going and going to gurus and asking questions. He says, that's the question that you need to be ask, asking. And he says, the reason is, is because Jewish people have a Jewish neshama. They have a Jewish soul. And the soul is connected up above. And the soul is never happy until it connects to the spirituality. Meaning that a Jewish soul is constantly searching, constantly seeking. And they're going to search and they're going to seek. If they don't see anything over here, they're going to go to Tibet. They're going to go to the gurus. They're going to go for everywhere because there's something that's pushing them inside that's not leaving them at peace. And they need to be at peace more so than the other nations of the world they're like okay well, whatever i'll live my life what do i care about all these questions that i have i just got to live my life and most people in the world that's how they have they got those blinders and they got to focus over there but jewish people there's something screaming inside of them there is this 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 power inside of them that's their soul screaming be like you're doing something that's missing we're missing the reality so our soul is screaming so even if we have the blinders HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends us those reminders HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends us those reminders and saying hey by the way look around there's something that's missing in your life there's something spiritual that's missing there's a, this contentness that you're missing because you're not connecting to the spirituality so yes we live in a, in a world of the ikfas of the Mashiach, where we're numb, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu is sending us signs, sending us signs and saying us, I'm here, I'm around, but not only the stimuli is coming from outside, it's also coming from inside. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is sending us these spurts, uh, bursts of like, of like Chachma, be like, wait a minute, maybe I should be better. We have these bursts of things that are coming in because our soul is not satisfied. There's so much that we need to grow, there's so much that we need to connect to, and we're missing that, and that's why we're getting all these signals. But if if we have these preconceived notions and if we have these these ideas then we and we don't change our outlook we won't begin to see it you know <clears throat> recently i was zeichel to be able to take a trip with my wife and we're able to visit uh, uh was a, a neflais habayra trip let's call it to see hashem's creation it was in america right so so um i went to we went to visit one national park and this uh, national park is a gorgeous park. It, it's, it's beautiful. The Neflai Sabara is beyond. 
And we went over there. It was nice. We went. We went on a, a you know on a path. We took the pictures. We we did everything that you're supposed to. Then I left the park, and then I was wondering. I'm like, you know what? Like, it was a beautiful park. Like. Why wasn't I more mesmerized by it? Like, why didn't that affect me more? Like, it's a crazy, like, it's something you don't see every day. It's like something out of like, you know, like you don't begin to see it, right? I'm like, why is it that it didn't affect me? Like, why is it that it didn't like, like, I wasn't blown away about it? And I was thinking about it. I'm like, why is it? And I'm like, you know what? Probably it was because of my outlook. You know, my outlook. You know, when we live our life, we're very busy. Everybody's always we're running over here, we're running over there. We're always doing. We never have a minute to like stop and contemplate and appreciate. And I realized, like you know, like I went away. I went with my wife. We were able to go and we're able to see something very beautiful. But my mindset was still, I gotta do this. I gotta do that. I gotta go over here. I have this phone call to make. I this move over and. I wasn't in the moment. I wasn't able, my outlook was, I had the blinders on. Like I wasn't able to look, I, I looked around, but I couldn't internalize.